Hello everyone, Dark of All Trades here. Now, do you think you know a lot of things? Do you think you know things at all? Do you think it is inevitable that you would know something? I don't pretend to be a super smart person, but I think I have some knowledge on a lot of different subjects. That is partially the inspiration behind my channel name. I teach students all over the world, and part of my job is talking to my students about pretty much any topic with an academic reason. If my student has a question about philosophy, I have to be ready to answer it. If my student wants to talk about Japanese trains, I have to be ready to talk about it with them. That is just part of the job. While I am definitely not an expert on most topics, I do tend to have something of a base knowledge on most topics. This leads me to today's video. Today's video comes from a channel called Made by Jim Bob. We could have had Jim Bob the son of God. <laughs> which is an excellent channel name. No notes on that. What this guy's actual name is does not matter. He is Jim Bob from now on. Jim Bob here puts out what seems to be the first in a series he's looking to start called Arguments Against Atheism. Today we're going to check out episode one. What do you think the actual argument is going to be? As of writing this, I haven't seen past the first 20 seconds, so I don't know either. Whatever it is, I'm hoping it will be at least a little intellectually stimulating. For now, let's turn it over to Jim Bob. Praise to him, Jim Bob. <laughs> He who finds a stuff and gets me a job, Jim Bob! In this first installment of Arguments Against Atheism, we explore a common position you may have heard from your atheist friends. We're like biological machines and all of our actions and thoughts and everything are all just like determined by laws of physics and chemistry. I mean, this is basically common knowledge now. Interesting take. Though the caricature of the atheist in his little drawing is definitely a form of trying to poison the well. As much as I could, I don't want to go into that depiction unless he continues to force that onto the atheist position. Needless to say, if this drawing is any indication, Jim Bob here doesn't seem to think highly of atheists. I don't know why. However, I do want to touch on what was said here, so I'll put it on screen. The idea that human behavior and thoughts are determined by the laws of physics and chemistry, often referred to as determinism or materialism, is a philosophical and scientific concept with a long history. At its core, it suggests that everything in the universe, including human beings, operates according to physical laws and interactions between particles. This viewpoint implies that free will is an illusion and that every action and decision we make ultimately can be traced back to preceding physical causes. Evidence supporting this idea comes from various fields. Studies in neuroscience have revealed the intricate workings of the brain and how neural activity correlates with thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Brain imaging techniques, such as fMRI and EEG, have shown specific brain regions activated during certain tasks or decision-making processes. This evidence suggests a strong link between physical brain processes and mental functions. Our genetic makeup plays a significant role in shaping our traits, behaviors, and predispositions. Research in genetics has identified specific genes associated with various personality traits, cognitive abilities, and even mental disorders. This genetic determinism suggests that our biology influences our behavior and choices. Environmental factors, including upbringing, education, culture, and social interactions, also shape human behavior. However, these influences can ultimately be traced back to physical interactions between individuals and their surroundings. Fundamental laws of physics, such as conservation of energy and the principles of cause and effect, suggest a deterministic universe where events unfold according to predetermined rules. While quantum mechanics introduces some randomness at the subatomic level, it does not necessarily invalidate determinism at macroscopic scales. I will say that critics of determinism have argued that it overlooks the complexity of human consciousness and the subjective experience of free will. They have pointed to phenomena such as creativity, moral responsibility, and the ability to reflect on one's actions as evidence against strict determinism. Additionally, some interpretations of quantum mechanics propose the uncertainty at the quantum level could potentially influence macroscopic events, including a degree of indeterminacy into the universe. I'm not convinced by these points, but some others are. If this is what he's going to talk about, he has a lot of work cut out for him. Overall, the debate over determinism versus free will remains a central issue in philosophy, psychology, and science, with no definitive resolution. It involves grappling with complex questions about the nature of consciousness, causality, and the relationship between mind and matter. While I generally don't like these kinds of labels, I would consider myself a determinist, but what about you? I know much of my audience is some flavor of atheist, but that doesn't mean we all think alike on this topic. Well, in this video, I'm going to give you a fatal argument against this position, and I do mean fatal. Wow, is it? As I stated before, this is a central issue in philosophy, psychology, and science. But even so, why would I say it is so challenging to argue against? 
Much of our current understanding of the human mind and behavior comes from empirical observations and scientific research in fields such as neuroscience, genetics, and psychology. The evidence supporting determinism is based on rigorous experimentation and observation, making it difficult to dismiss outright. The human brain is an immensely complex system with billions of neurons and trillions of synaptic connections. Understanding how these intricate networks give rise to consciousness, thoughts, and behaviors is a daunting task. Any attempt to refute determinism needs to offer a compelling alternative explanation for the observed phenomena. Determinism aligns with fundamental principles of physics, such as the conservation of energy and causality. These principles have been extensively tested and validated through experimentation and mathematical modeling. Any alternative explanation would need to reconcile with these well-established scientific principles. Advances in neuroscience continue to deepen our understanding of the brain and its role in shaping behavior. As our knowledge in this field grows, it becomes increasingly challenging to argue for a non-materialistic explanation of human cognition and behavior without disregarding or misinterpreting neuroscientific findings. The principle of Occam's razor suggests that the simpler explanations are generally preferable to more complex ones, provided they account for all the observed phenomena. Determinism offers a straightforward explanation for the relationship between physical processes and human behavior, making it more parsimonious compared to alternative hypotheses. Rejecting determinism raises philosophical questions about the nature of causality, free will, and the mind-body relationship. Any alternative perspective must address these philosophical implications coherently and offer a robust framework for understanding human agency and consciousness. Overall, arguing against determinism requires confronting a vast body of scientific evidence, grappling with the complexity of the human brain, and providing compelling alternative explanations that is consistent with both empirical observation and established scientific principles. While skepticism and critical inquiry are essential in advancing our understanding of the mind, overturning a well-supported scientific consensus requires substantial evidence and rigorous theoretical justification. Good luck, Jim Bob. Welcome to Arguments Against Atheism. Thank you, Jim Bob. It's good to be here. I hope we can have a polite pseudo-interaction with absolutely no straw men whatsoever. A series that aims to provide clear and simple arguments against common atheist positions. I'm Jim Bob, and I'm here to deliver the goods. He is Jim Bob. Excellent. Well, Jim Bob, I'm Dark of All Trades, and I'm here to critique your arguments. I'm a professor, so I hope you brought your literal A-game. First, I should clarify, not everyone who is an atheist believes that matter exists and only matter exists, nor does every atheist necessarily defend hard determinism. Excellent start. Atheists as a whole are diverse in their thinking around philosophy and metaphysics. I don't know how many atheists subscribe to determinism or materialism. However, just like not every Christian will believe the Kalam cosmological argument, we can still discuss the argument that some adhere to and make evaluations to see if the argument holds any merit. Since I happen to be a determinist, I look forward to what this guy has to say on the matter. However, these are common positions taken by atheists. Well, atheism is just like the position that holds, like, there's no belief in a god. Like, what are you even talking about? Well, yes, and many of you come to that position based on the assumption that physicality is all there is. I don't think there is data on this. So how could you know that the cause of many atheists becoming atheists is based on the assumption that physicality is all there is? While it is true that some atheists may hold the belief that physicality is all there is, atheism itself is not contingent on such an assumption. As he seemed to agree with his caricature on, atheism is simply the absence of belief in gods or deities. It doesn't inherently dictate a worldview or metaphysical stance beyond that. Just as religious beliefs can vary widely among individuals, so too can the philosophical perspectives of atheists. Some atheists may indeed embrace a materialistic or naturalistic worldview, while others may hold different metaphysical beliefs or remain agnostics on such questions. Therefore, it would be inaccurate to generalize that all or many atheists come to their position based on the assumption of physicalism without considering the diverse range of perspectives within the atheist community. And to assert this as a fact like he did is a skosh dishonest. So let's examine the assumption. According to the view that we are all merely biological machines, our actions, our thoughts, and our words are all determined by the laws of physics and chemistry. Let's say it in a much more direct way. Everything we think, everything we say, everything we do are all effects determined by physics and chemistry. I don't have much of an issue with this explanation. It may be slightly more nuanced than this, but I understand this is not a science channel, so in a general sense, this is probably fine. Okay. Well, let's take a look at some other effects of physics in the natural world. Let's take a tornado. This is an effect of a cause. Let's call it a combination of natural conditions. 
This is a blade of grass growing. Another effect of a cause, also a combination of natural conditions. These are two occurrences entirely determined by the laws of physics. Now, would it make sense to say one of these occurrences are more true or more false than the other? No, they just are. They're effects. I would say this is acceptable so far. He is basically making an analogy. By comparing human thoughts, actions, and behaviors to natural phenomena like tornadoes and blades of grass, he illustrates the idea that they are all effects determined by physical and chemical processes. This analogy helps to highlight the deterministic perspective that everything in the universe operates according to physical laws, without assigning truth or falsehood to these phenomena themselves. Instead, they simply are, as effects of underlying physical causes. I think this is the most accurate video I've made a response to so far. Uh, he's getting my hopes up. We could say that a description of one or the other could be more accurate or less accurate, but as far as the effect goes, it is what it is. It's just an effect. It's not true or false. Because it's not propositional. It's an effect of physics. Make sense? Uh... Now, here's where we have a problem. If all of our thoughts and words and actions are caused by the laws of physics, then they too are effects of physics. That means our descriptions of tornadoes or blades of grass are also just effects which are determined by the laws of physics and chemistry. Correct. When we describe natural phenomena like tornadoes and the growth of blades of grass, our descriptions are influenced by a multitude of factors, just like everything else we do. Our environment, upbringing, education, and genetic predispositions all shape how we perceive and interpret the world around us. For example, our cultural background and educational experiences may affect the language we use to describe these phenomena, while our genetic predispositions may influence our cognitive abilities and perceptual biases. Additionally, societal norms and scientific knowledge play a role in shaping the frameworks we use to understand and explain natural events. Therefore, while tornadoes and blades of grass are determined by laws of physics and chemistry, our descriptions and interpretations of these phenomena are also influenced by a complex interplay of environmental, educational, and genetic factors. These factors are all ultimately based on our underlying laws of physics and chemistry. Our environment is shaped by physical processes such as weather patterns and geological forces, while our education is governed by the interactions of atoms and molecules in our brains. Similarly, our genetic predispositions are encoded in the molecular structure of our DNA, subject to the principles of molecular biology. I don't see the issue just yet. Well, didn't we just establish that effects of physics are neither true or false? Why, yes, I believe we did. The effects themselves are neither true nor false. He seems to be suggesting that if everything, including human thoughts and actions, is determined by physical processes, then labeling them as true or false might not be appropriate. This is because, in a deterministic framework, events are seen as outcomes of physical causality rather than statements that can be evaluated in terms of truth or falsehood. They are simply what they are, effects of physical processes, rather than being true or false propositions. I think I know where he's going, and this is not a new objection, but I'm not sure, so I'm not going to jump to conclusions. They just are. How can an effect of physics be anything other than what it is, what it's determined to be by the law? I see it coming, but I'm not going to jump into it just yet. This statement slash question seems to reinforce the determinist viewpoint that effects and phenomena in the physical world unfold according to the predetermined causal chains governed by natural laws. From this perspective, there is a sense of inevitability to the outcomes of physical processes, that they are what they are determined to be by the underlying laws of physics. When a cat pushes something off a table, we know what is going to happen. The object will fall. And the more we know about the scenario, how high the table is, what the object's made out of, what the ground's made out of, etc., we can make more accurate predictions about what will happen to the object. Just like everything else, with more accurate information, we can make better predictions about the effects something will have. The way he asks this question is a bit suspect. It seems like he's posing this as some sort of challenge to the determinist position, suggesting that if effects of physics are inherently determined by the laws of nature, then there is no room for alternative interpretations or freedom of choice. The deterministic framework doesn't necessarily preclude the existence of descriptions or interpretations of physical phenomena. While it is true that physical effects are determined by the laws of physics, our descriptions and interpretations of these effects are influenced by our perspectives, knowledge, and cognitive processes. In other words, while the outcomes of physical processes may be determined by natural laws, our understanding and conceptualization of these outcomes are subject to human interpretation. This distinction shows that determinism primarily concerns the causal relation between physical events rather than the validity or accuracy of descriptions or interpretations of those events. If an evaluation or proposition is an effect of physics, how can it be wrong or right? It is true that determinism implies that evaluations or propositions are ultimately the products of physical processes. However, this question seems to conflate descriptive claims about physical events with normative judgments about the correctness or validity of events or propositions. 
Jim Bob has made a category error. Determinism primarily concerns descriptive statements about the causal relationships between events and the physical world. However, the assessment of whether evaluations or propositions are right or wrong typically involves normative judgments that go beyond mere descriptions of physical events. For example, when we evaluate a moral proposition or assess the validity of a logical argument, we are engaging in normative reasoning that extends beyond deterministic explanations of physical causality. These evaluations are based on criteria such as moral principles, logical consistency, or empirical evidence, which are distinct from the deterministic causal chains that govern physical phenomena. Therefore, while determinism may shape the conditions under which evaluations or propositions arise, it doesn't preclude the possibility of making normative assessments about the correctness or validity. One could believe that the aforementioned tornado is actually a giant banana, and while they would be incorrect, that doesn't change anything ontologically. The physical reality of the tornado remains unaffected by the incorrect belief. Similarly, normative assessments of evaluations or propositions don't alter the underlying physical processes that determine their existence, but they do serve as valuable tools for human reasoning and decision-making. It just is, like a blade of grass or a tornado. Now, my critics will say, no, Jim Bob, propositions are different because they are descriptions of effects, to which I would respond, well, those descriptions are just effects determined by the laws of physics, right? Yeah, but we can evaluate our descriptions and see if they comport with reality, to which I would respond. Are evaluations just effects determined by the laws of physics? Yeah, but we can test to see if our evaluations are accurate, to which I would respond. Isn't testing just another effect determined by physics and chemistry? So we have a determined effect of physics we call an evaluation followed by another determined effect of physics we call a description, followed by another determined effect of physics called testing, which requires more effects, more effects, more effects, and on. Yeah, so what's the problem? Under determinism, how we react is a determined factor. The atheist's response here emphasizes the role of cognitive processes in shaping human cognition and behavior, pointing out that while they are influenced by physical processes, they introduce a level of complexity and agency that goes beyond simplistic deterministic explanations. However, this acknowledgement does not necessarily contradict determinism, but rather suggests that the deterministic framework may need to account for the complexity of cognitive processes in understanding human behavior. Determinism does not necessarily deny the existence of cognitive processes or human agency, but rather suggests that they emerge from and are shaped by underlying physical processes. This perspective allows for the recognition of human autonomy and rationality within the deterministic framework. Yeah, so what's the problem? Well, the problem is it's a vicious circle. And this is where I gift you the fatal argument against this position. Premise one, effects of physics are neither more true or false than any other effects of physics. Oh good, we have a more formal argument. At least I don't have to come up with it from everything being said here. Let's evaluate this premise a little more in depth. This premise underscores the objective nature of physical effects, implying that they can exist independent of subjective interpretation or evaluation. The premise also aligns with the deterministic perspective by emphasizing that physical effects unfold according to predetermined laws of physics without inherent truth or falsehood. The premise overlooks the role of human interpretation and evaluation in assessing the significance or validity of physical effects. While physical events may be objectively observable, our understanding and interpretation of them can vary based on epistemic context and cognitive biases. While true in the realm of physical causality, the premise may not fully capture the complexities of truth and falsehood in other domains, such as mathematics, ethics, and metaphysics, where truth values are often a matter of logical coherence or normative evaluation. Overall, the premise captures an aspect of the objective nature of physical phenomena within a deterministic framework, but may oversimplify the relationship between truth, falsehood, and physical causality. It is essential to consider the broader epistemic context and the limitations of applying binary truth values to all types of effects. This premise may be acceptable in the sense that it acknowledges the objectivity of physical effects as outcomes of deterministic processes. However, like I said before, it is crucial to recognize the distinction between descriptive claims about physical phenomena and normative judgments about truth or falsehood in other domains of inquiry. For now, I can generally accept premise one. Let's move on to the next premise. Premise two, thoughts, evaluations, and propositions are effects of physics. Just like the first premise, let's take a closer look at this one. The premise is consistent with the deterministic view that all events in the universe, including mental events, are ultimately determined by physical processes. It reflects the idea that mental phenomena arise as emergent properties of complex physical systems, such as the human brain. The premise supports a reductionist approach to understanding mental phenomena, suggesting that mental processes can be reduced to underlying physical mechanisms. 
This reductionist perspective is in line with the deterministic worldview, which seeks to explain complex phenomena in terms of simpler deterministic processes. While the premise suggests that mental processes are determined by physical processes, it may oversimplify the complexity of consciousness and subjective experience. Mental phenomena such as consciousness and subjective feelings present challenges to reductionist explanations solely in terms of physical causation. The premise raises questions about the relationship between physical processes in the brain and subjective experiences. The gap between physical processes and the qualitative aspects of consciousness remain a significant challenge in understanding how mental phenomena emerge from physical substrates. Overall, while the premise aligns with the deterministic worldview and reductionist approaches to understanding mental phenomena, it also highlights the important philosophical questions about the nature of consciousness, mental causation, and the relationship between physical processes and subjective experiences. The complexity of these issues suggests that a comprehensive understanding of the deterministic perspective on mental phenomena requires further investigation and interdisciplinary dialogue. While some determinists might acknowledge the complexities of consciousness and subjective experiences, I would say that I can generally accept premise 2. What's next? Conclusion. Evaluations and propositions are not more true or false than other evaluations and propositions. They just are. I can agree with this. Based on the premises, this seems like a logical conclusion. I see some major issues with the argument as he is trying to present it, but for now, I will agree that this argument is valid and sound. Let's see where he goes from here. You see, the consequence of this position is fatal to knowledge itself. If any knowledge claim or belief is just an effect of physics, and what we call knowledge is dependent on truth or falsity of a claim, then knowledge is impossible because evaluations and claims are just effects of physics and effects are neither true or false, they just are. This seems like a lot to take in, so let me break this down to a more structured form. Premise one, knowledge claims or beliefs are just effects of physics. Premise two, knowledge is dependent on the truth or falsity of a claim. Conclusion. Therefore, knowledge is impossible because evaluations and claims are just effects of physics, and effects are neither true nor false, they just are. This looks like a solid argument against determinism, but I've already pointed out one problem earlier that I knew was coming. Let's see what the issues with this are. This conflates two distinct categories, physical causation and truth slash falsity in knowledge claims. Premise 1 asserts that knowledge claims are effects of physics, while Premise 2 introduces the criterion of truth or falsity as a condition for knowledge. This conflation makes the argument incoherent. The conclusion that knowledge is impossible is a non sequitur. It does not necessarily follow from the premises. Even if knowledge claims are effects of physics and knowledge depends on the truth or falsity of claims, it doesn't logically follow that knowledge itself becomes impossible. This inference seems to oversimplify the relationship between physical causation and epistemic justification. The syllogism presents a simplified understanding of knowledge as solely dependent on truth or falsity of claims, without considering other epistemic factors such as justification, belief, and reliability. This oversimplification may lead to an inadequate representation of the nature of knowledge. The conclusion assumes that because knowledge claims are effects of physics and effects are neither true nor false, knowledge itself becomes impossible. However, this assumption is not clearly justified within the structure of the argument and may require further elaboration or justification. This argument commits an equivocation fallacy, where the argument switches between different meanings of a term, in this case knowledge and knowledge claims, to make an invalid inference. Knowledge typically refers to something like justified true belief or justified true belief that corresponds to reality, while knowledge claims are assertions or statements about what is known. It is not logically justified to conclude that because knowledge claims are effects of physics, knowledge itself becomes impossible. Lastly, the argument oversimplifies the nature of knowledge by reducing it to a binary criterion of truth or false. Knowledge involves more than just true or false claims. It also encompasses justification, belief, and reliability. By oversimplifying knowledge in this way, the argument commits the fallacy of oversimplification. There is a crucial distinction between the physical processes of obtaining information and the claims or assertions made about that information. While it is true that the acquisition and processing of information includes forming beliefs and making claims, it may be influenced by physical processes. It doesn't necessarily follow that the truth or falsity of those claims is determined solely by physical causation. Knowledge involves not just the physical act of obtaining information, but also the epistemic evaluation and justification of beliefs. Therefore, while knowledge claims may be influenced by physical processes, the assessment of their truth or falsity involves epistemic considerations that go beyond mere physical causation. So while this looks like a hard defeater at first, examining it closer reveals many issues. Of course, this topic is hotly debated, and I cannot say I've solved it entirely. Whether one accepts this idea or not depends on the individual's philosophical stance. From a deterministic standpoint, Jim Bob's rebuttal just doesn't hold up.
The position gets worse. If all of our thoughts, actions, and beliefs are effects determined by the laws of physics, then a Christian belief and an atheist belief and any other worldview is just an effect of physics. Truth and falsity in belief systems are often evaluated within the context of those belief systems themselves. From a deterministic perspective, different belief systems may emerge as products of complex interactions among physical processes, environmental factors, cultural influences, and personal experiences. However, the assessment of the truth or falsity of beliefs can still be meaningful within the framework of those belief systems. While determinism may suggest that beliefs are determined by physical causes, it doesn't necessarily invalidate the internal coherence or consistency of those belief systems. Individuals within a particular belief system may evaluate the truth or falsity of their beliefs based on internal criteria such as religious texts, philosophical arguments, empirical evidence, or personal experiences. Additionally, while determinism may challenge the notion of free will in the traditional sense, it doesn't necessarily preclude the possibility of rational inquiry, critical thinking, and the pursuit of truth within belief systems. Even if beliefs are determined by physical processes, individuals can still engage in reasoned discourse, debate, and reflection to assess the validity of their beliefs and reconcile conflicting perspectives. Therefore, while determinism may provide a framework for understanding the causal determinants of beliefs, it doesn't necessarily render beliefs meaningless or devoid of truth value within their respective contexts. Saying a Christian has a false belief is equivalent to saying they have a false effect of physics. This is that category error again. It conflates the domain of beliefs with the domain of physical effects. Beliefs belong in the realm of cognition and epistemology, while effects of physics pertain to physical phenomena governed by natural laws. Saying that a belief is false implies a judgment about its correspondence with reality or truth conditions, which operates within the realm of epistemology. On the other hand, effects of physics refer to causal relationships in the physical world, which are typically evaluated based on empirical evidence and scientific inquiry. To put this very simply, while beliefs are subject to evaluation through epistemological frameworks, their formation and expression are governed by the laws of physics. How can we believe anything other than which is strictly determined by the laws of physics? Exactly, we don't. We don't control what we believe. Beliefs are not choices. They are determined by various factors, including our experiences, upbringing, education, and genetics. If beliefs are strictly determined by the laws of physics, as determinism suggests, then it follows that we cannot believe anything other than what these determinants dictate. Is Jim Bob implying that changes in beliefs pose a challenge to determinism? I'm not sure, but just in case, I'll address this. Beliefs change based on the same factors that shape them initially, such as new sensory input or reassessment of evidence. This process is well understood in psychology and aligns with the principles of determinism. How can an effect of physics be false? Well, the atheist might say, well, some effects of physics can be true and some can be false. I have never heard a single person, let alone an atheist, say this. I suppose there may be things like false positives or false correlations, but not false effects. Okay, so if one effect of physics can be true or false, here's my challenge to the atheist who holds this position. What is the categorical difference between a tornado and thinking? Well, they might say, duh, a tornado isn't doing any evaluating. Well, let's try again. What is the difference between a tornado and evaluating? Well, like the difference is like complexity and stuff. Okay, let's look at the level of complexity. What is the difference between an extremely complex machine and a very simple machine? Other than potentially more components executing a wider variety of functions, the complex and the simple are both at the effect of physical laws. And as far as we know, a computer doesn't do anything more than what it's programmed to do, regardless of its complexity. The computer doesn't suddenly transcend its category of being a machine simply because it's more complex. So why would the brain from this position? I let that play mostly because I don't want to cut anything out if I don't have to. I don't subscribe to the idea that he slash his fictional atheist caricature is presenting here, nor do I know any atheist that does, nor does this have anything to do with atheism itself. And this is already getting long, so I don't really need to respond to this. In conclusion, if all thoughts, evaluations, and propositions are merely effects of physical laws and chemistry, how can a physical effect be false or true? There are no false tornadoes or blades of grass. So why would the naturalistic atheists believe that there are false beliefs? Why bad thing happen? As I stated before, this is a category error. To reiterate for the last time, while the contents of beliefs are subject to evaluation, therefore can be true or false, their formation and expression are not. And that's the end of his video. So what was Jim Bob saying in this video?
There's a common position among atheists that human actions, thoughts, and behaviors are determined by the laws of physics and chemistry. The fatal flaw in this is that if everything is determined by physical laws, including thoughts and beliefs, then knowledge itself becomes impossible. If it were true that evaluations and propositions are considered effects of physics, it leads to the conclusion that they are neither true nor false. How can beliefs be considered true or false if they're merely effects of physical laws? Atheists need to justify their belief in false beliefs within a deterministic framework. All in all, this wasn't really a takedown of determinism, and certainly not of materialism. He did mention that not all atheists believed in this, so I can't really criticize Jimmy B too harshly. He made a simple mistake that, realistically, anyone could have made. However, trying to disprove a hotly discussed point in philosophy doesn't quite work. People have been discussing this idea at least since Laplace and Hobbes during the Enlightenment era, 17th and 18th century. If it hasn't been solved by now, the chances of me or another random YouTuber solving it are pretty slim. That's it for this one, so what did you think? Do you think Jim Beam's argument thoroughly thrashed determinism? Or do you think atheism is safe for another day? Let me know in the comments below. It is already determined whether you're going to hit the like button or not, so fulfill your destiny! For more of these evaluations and justifications, you can justify subscribing if you haven't already. Though I have no choice but to extend a heartfelt thanks to my patrons, Calamitous Anima, Sora, Longhaired Lefty, Musical Ocelot, Ooga Booga Luga, Tarek Alkasab, Jammin Bomb, Kai Henningsen, and Triple Tau, who are the unstoppable physics that keep my channel going. If you're looking to be a part of the inevitable, you can join them for as low as a single dollar a month at patreon.com front slash dark of all trades. Every time I see one of you pop up, it changes my belief in the day I'm having to something better. Seriously, thank you. And as always, keep learning.